Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here today for this webinar. My name is Julia Gilberto, and I work for the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. If you're not familiar with NCPD, NCPD works to promote the meaningful participation of persons with disabilities in church and in society. To learn more, you can go to ncpd.org or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We're very grateful to have Dr. Miguel Romero with us here today, who has been an NCPD board member since 2016. He's an assistant professor of religious and theological studies at Salve Regina University. His published work is in moral theology, Catholic social teaching, theological method, and the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. In 2017, Dr. Romero presented at the Vatican on sacramental catechesis during the Catechesis in Persons with Disabilities Conference, sponsored by the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization. Dr. Romero's forthcoming book is entitled, Destiny of the Wounded Creature, St. Thomas Aquinas on Disability. This webinar is based on a talk entitled, Wonderfully Made, Creation, Human Dignity, and the Gift of Vulnerability. This talk was given in 2019 at a symposium planned by NCPD and the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. Dr. Romero will give a presentation about this lecture that he gave, and then there'll be time for questions. So please feel free to leave questions in the Q&A box below. Now I will hand it over to Dr. Romero. Dr. Romero, thank you very much for being with us here today. Thanks. Oh, great, okay. So I'm assuming you can see me okay. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, uh, I'm really happy that there's so many folks uh, uh, joining us from across the country. Um, I received a little bit of a snapshot of how many people there are, and it's just it's just it's really wonderful to see so many folks. Um, although I teach classes, or I have been teaching classes online uh, the past couple months, uh, uh, this is the first webinar I've, I've ever done that's quite like this. So uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to dive right in and, and give a summary of the talk. I know most of most folks probably watched it within the past day or two. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick summary, and then we can uh, have a conversation uh, about uh, some of the themes that came up. Um, so as uh, for those of you who watched it, uh, uh, you'll recall that it started off with a question, uh, why are you here? That was an important question for us, uh, for NCPD, and those of us who are thinking about that particular gathering is, is uh, why are folks gathered for this conference? And our agenda, our concern, and our interest was to provide a context for a distinctively Catholic theological reflection on disability. So I started off the talk with the question, why are you here? And one of the things I was uh, keen to highlight was uh, the possibility and the fact that there may be a difference between the conception of disability that inspired each of our individual interests of the symposium and the Christian theological approach to the realities that oftentimes get lumped together under the heading disability. Now, that wasn't to dismiss or, uh, 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 or, or disparage any of the various reasons that we were bringing to the conference, but it was uh, uh, intended to highlight the particular work we were interested in doing. And just for that purpose, I highlighted the story of one of my students and the kind of, uh, the kind of question she brought to a course that I often teach on theology and disability. So, the point of emphasis of that first part was to highlight that our concern for that conference and that symposium was to think deeply about the way Christians think, speak, and argue theologically about impairment, illness, and injury. Um, uh, so to start that off, I, I introduced a classic distinction, or rather classic definition of the work of theology, faith seeking understanding, faith seeking understanding. Uh, and I gave reference to uh, that passage from Paul where, he where we receive a definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So the particular work of Christian theology begins with the specific convictions and the particular assurances about what has been revealed by God uh, in and through Jesus Christ. Those convictions and those assurances are fundamental starting points. They're the first principles, you could say, that define the work of theology when thinking about our ordinary experience of impairment, illness, and injury. 
So beginning with those convictions and beginning with those assurances, we can we then move to talk and think about the Christian account of the human being. And I walked us through some of the basics of the orthodox standard traditional Christian account of the human being. Well, Christian theology, when we're thinking about the human being, it begins with the uncaused and unchanging God of love. That's where we begin. The one who creates, who intimately sustains and dignifies fragile creatures like us. So if the focus of the theological engagement is creatures like us, the whole story, the full and complete picture, it includes convictions about the kind of beings that we are, convictions about what it means to be a human being. One of the things that's been inspiring to me and that has guided uh, quite a bit of my work is uh, the way Pope St. Pope John Paul II uh, defines this particular starting point. He does this in a, in a, a 2004 document, uh, uh, or statement rather, uh, at the International Symposium on the Dignity and Rights of the Mentally Disabled Person. Now, what St. Pope John Paul II says is that the starting point for every Christian reflection on disability must be rooted in the fundamental convictions of Christian anthropology. The starting point for every Christian reflection on disability must be rooted in the fundamental convictions of Christian anthropology. Well, what are some of those? Well, we are creatures, and we are particular kinds of creatures. We are creatures formed in the image of God, beings capable of knowing and loving God. We can know and love God in the way God knows and loves God's self. And not only that, we're composite beings. Uh, we're beings that have a body, and, uh, and we're beings that have a soul or spirit. And we're vulnerable beings. We're dependent beings. And we're wounded. We are wounded and mired in, in spiritual and physical pains, and we are broken as we are. Wounded as we are, our Creator calls us to goodness and holiness. Now, taking this picture, uh, the Council Fathers of Vatican II and the, the document Gaudium et Spes, one of the things they highlight is uh, uh, man is not allowed, quote, man is not allowed to despise his bodily life. Rather, the human being is obliged to regard his or her body as good and as honorable, end quote. Now that picture, that valuing of the body, and uh, this, this highlighting of, this, uh, of the importance of the body is integral to the distinctively Christian account of the human being. Now, this has implications. It has implications, especially when we're thinking about impairment, illness, and injury. Among those is that the vulnerability and dependencies of our body are understood to be creaturely goods. The vulnerability and dependencies of our body are goods. These are enduring aspects of our original nakedness, which are not in themselves a cause for shame. So to unpack that a bit more, I, I, I let us in, uh, in reflection, uh, uh, drawing upon St. Thomas Aquinas, and in particular, St. Thomas Aquinas on vulnerability and the vulnerability of our bodies. This is uh, uh, the point of reflection was the, from his Summa uh, Theologica. Uh, the first part, uh, question 91, uh, article three. So in that particular uh, question and that particular article, Aquinas asked the question, was the human being given an apt bodily disposition? Was the human being given an apt bodily disposition? Now that question is about uh, the goodness and beauty of our bodies. Now, the driving force of that question is not an extension of what is human nature. He's not asking, are we vulnerable? Uh, are we dependent? Rather, the driving force of the question is, what are we to think about human nature? What are we to think about our vulnerabilities and dependencies in the light of the gospel? Is the corruptible aspect of our nature, the fact that our bodies break, is this fitting? Is this good? Is this appropriate to, the, to our dignity? Is this, is this appropriate to our graced destiny as creatures formed in the image and likeness of God? So we walked through that, uh, that, the, that particular article with St. Thomas, and, and we highlighted there at the end uh, St. Thomas's conclusion. 
God gave to each natural being, I'm, I'm quoting here, St. Thomas writes, God gave to each natural being the best disposition, not absolutely so, but in the view of its proper end. God fashioned the human body in that disposition which was best, befitting to such a form and to such operations, end quote. So that's a complex sentence, and uh, uh, sometimes it can be challenging to read St. Thomas, but according to St. Thomas, the vulnerability of our bodies to impairment, illness, and injury, it goes hand in hand with the gift of all the various ways we sense and experience the world. We need these kinds of bodies to grow and to change, to develop, and to, uh, and to, to grow, change, and to, de and to develop in the way that we are created to, in a way that's consistent with our dignity. So at the end of that uh, uh, presentation, I highlighted uh, a point that I, uh, that I noted at the beginning, that the gospel challenges our presuppositions about disability. And I noted two big takeaways uh, for the symposium about what the symposium was about and who the symposium was about. If our thinking about these matters begins with the faith of the church, well, disability was not the main topic of the symposium. And the subject was not a, a special class of persons out there called the disabled. The what of the symposium is what does it mean to be a human being, a creature created in the image and likeness of God? And the who of the symposium was us, us in that room and us here today gathered for this conversation. Now, that's the who. No amount of tinkering will make a difference if we overlook how the gospel challenges some of our most precious and basic presumptions about the theological significance of disability. Now, that was the, the scope and the shape of uh, that presentation that you all watched in preparation for today. Now, I'm really excited and eager to entertain questions um, and, and to have a conversation for those who are interested. Uh, so I will pass it on back to Julia. Thank you very much, Dr. Romero. Um, we have a couple other guests with us today, which I'm just going to introduce. We have um, Father Fred Cabres, and Father Fred is, um, he belongs to the Capuchin Franciscan province of St. Joseph in Detroit. He is a social worker, and he played a major role in making the symposium this past November possible. So we're very grateful to have him here today. Um, we also have Esther Garcia, who's a staff member at NCPD, and she is the Director of Outreach and Diocesan Relations. So thank you both for being here today. I'm just going to start your videos. There we go. So, thank you, Julia. I appreciate uh, you taking the time. And uh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Romero, for all of your wonderful words and uh, insights. It's so wonderful to see you again. Well, thank you, Father, for your gift <laughs> in making the symposium possible. Thank oh. you and your community. Thank you. Um, so I really love the, uh, the concept of vulnerability. I think it's such, a, such an important thing because I think we, um, as people, um, as uh, faith-filled lovers of Christ, uh, of God, and as imperfect beings uh, in search of a perfect God, right? Um, and so our vulnerability is what draws us closer to, to God. Um, I'm curious to, uh, to see what your thoughts are in the wake of a lot of the vulnerabilities and a lot of the uh, struggles that we're facing in this world, um, specifically looking at um, the rise of the COVID-19, looking at uh, the rise of uh, George Floyd and all of the uh, brutality that we have faced there. Um, how can we as a, as a Christian community, as persons who experience uh, disability and those who experience uh, struggle, um, walk with this community in, in, uh, um, in a spirited way that uh, carries on the message of uh, Christian anthropology? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I, this is how I think about it. Uh, uh, every human being is vulnerable, and we're vulnerable in all sorts of different ways. Um, 
uh, part of what it means to be a creature, the kind of creatures that, that we are is we are limited and weak. And we also are graced, human beings are, are graced and given gifts and competencies. And uh, where those competencies and strengths meet vulnerabilities and weaknesses, uh, it happens in communion and in community. Um, now, the, the words or the language that the church traditionally puts to that encounter um, is mercy, right? It's where uh, uh, the strengths and competencies of one meet the weaknesses and vulnerabilities of another. Now, one of the things that's important to remember about the Christian understanding of mercy is uh, these aren't just the there aren't just the corporeal works of mercy. There's the spiritual works of mercy. Um, if we begin with the fundamentals of Christian theological anthropology, this basic outlook, this vision of the cosmos that we receive in the gospel and the good news, we get of a complex picture about how we think about illness, uh, injury, injustice, um, uh, 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 how we think about hunger, how we think about. Uh, fear, how we think about those who are lost and afraid, those who are unmoored, uh, uh, those matter. They're vitally important. But there are also spiritual works of mercy, uh, uh, works of mercy pertaining uh, um, uh, to, to ignorance, those who lack knowledge, uh, pertaining to those who, uh, who don't know how to go on, uh, who, those who are confused, uh, uh, works of mercy uh, pertaining to truth-telling, um, uh, to, to challenging the sinner, uh, works of mercy pertaining to forgiveness and mercy, uh, or, or forgiveness, forgiving wrongs. Works of mercy related to prayer. Um, works of mercy can, pertaining to, to spiritual companionship. This is a complex picture of how we engage and meet one another amid our vulnerabilities, limitations, and, de and dependencies, and our strengths and our competencies. And this is what is beautiful about what I think is beautiful about uh, the Christian tradition uh, around the works of mercy is that there is a point of access for everyone. Um, it's not just for the wealthy and, and the physically strong or the circumstantially wealthy, that, there, uh, uh, that there is something to be, there's always something to be taught or there's always something to be, a lesson to be given about, pra a practical lesson to be given. Um, anyone can extend uh, uh, forgiveness or wrong that's done. Anyone uh, um, can pray. At the very least, we can pray and be a presence to one another. Uh, the, uh, the mercy of solidarity. Solidarity is one of the spiritual works of mercy. Um, uh, 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 but in this moment, also, I think uh, 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 challenging the sinner, highlighting wrongs, that is also a work of mercy. Uh, that's one that we often forget, but it's rooted in the love of God, and it's oriented towards communion with God. Uh, uh, that's my best thoughts on the answer. D did I answer your question, Father? <laughs> yes, you did. You did, and you did it wonderfully. Thank you. That um, I think bringing in the uh, the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy is just wonderful because I think in, in in light of everything going on, I think it's it's a chance for us to to respond, and it gives us uh, a place to start. Um, and, I, and I love how you said that. Uh, this ability that everyone has a starting point. Everyone can be able to start somewhere within the Christian anthropology and within the Christian faith. And so even if it's something as simple as, you know, um, somebody who's younger who's struggling with their faith or somebody who's older who's been experienced in life, they can enter into that and they can uh, meet a person where they're at and meet that person where they're at and be able to um, connect together in a, in a divine way uh, as creatures of the divine. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. Well, what I appreciate about what you highlighted there is that, that it's, um, it's that the works of mercy are connected uh, to our relationship with God. Um, uh, it, these, these aren't just things that live between individuals, uh, that these, this is how we participate in the love of God and how we perform and in, enter into our intimacy with our creator um, as individuals. Thank you. Sure. We have a great comment from Carol um, that I was wondering if you could respond to. She says, vulnerable, fragile, interdependence. These are words we need to remember in a world that focuses on independence, power, and perfection, and where these are often the measure. So not as the world judges, 
we need to be able to separate ourselves from the world. Um, oh yeah, uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful distinction um, uh, 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 about that comp the compl complement complementary nature of those two social positions. But what I was particularly striking about the comment was this distinction uh, 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 between us and the world. See, this is, uh, uh, this is the, the church world distinction, what it means for the church to be uh, uh, strangers in a strange land, to be sojourners uh, that, um, um, that are on their way to participate and partake in the city of God. This is something that is important for us to remember. This place is not home. Um, uh, it is home in the, in the sense that this is the gift that is given for, for now. Um, but there is a purpose, there's an end, there's a goal uh, in our life together and how we engage and interact with one another. Uh, uh, when, uh, this is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about in relationship to Catholic, to Catholic social teaching. Um, what I've learned from uh, 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 John Paul II, uh, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the Pope De Benedict the Sixteenth, and now Pope Francis, um, uh, this is the moral witness of the church in the world is oriented towards shining a light on what, on what we are called to as creatures. And uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of my mentors said it this way, and I'll, and I'll, I'll quote him now, uh, that uh, the world needs, to ch needs the church to, to tell it that it's the world. That's, we have a ministry and a mission um, uh, to shine the light on brokenness and woundedness um, and, uh, as we journey together and invite others. Uh, along the way. This is the evangelical mission of the church in the world to communicate the good news. I know you've talked about St. John Paul II having a major influence on your understanding of disability. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Why he's so influential to you? Why Pope John Paul II is, has been influential to me on uh, in his way of thinking about disability? Yes. Um, yeah, there, there's a couple ways I can get into this, right? Um, uh, uh, here's, here's one way. Uh, uh, we, we could take a point of departure with his emphasis on Christian anthropology being the starting point. Um, uh, 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 I, I began thinking about disability uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, I mean, this is something I grew up with. It was part of my family life. It was part of um, uh, my college life. It was just part of what it meant to be who I, who I am and, and how I move through the world, um, in, in particular in relationship to my brother, Vicente. Um, one of the things a person will discover along the way uh, when they start trying to think deeply and carefully about disability as a concept or disability as an idea is that you have some options, right? Um, uh, uh, there are different ways of thinking about disability. Uh, and what Pope John Paul II has provided me, and what I found in his writings, is uh, a, a gesture, uh, an insight about uh, where we should begin our thinking. And what does it look like for us to be doing our very best thinking about a particular topic? Now, we can ask all, ourselves all kinds of questions. Um, uh, we, we can think about any topic or ask ourselves, what does it mean to think well about trees? Or what does it mean to think well about cars or, we or webinars or politics? Like we can ask these kinds of questions. So there are lots of ways we can think about these things. We can begin with our experience. We can begin with a the problem or a circumstance. We, could, we can begin with um, uh, um, uh, 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 our sense experience of the world. And there's nothing wrong with those starting points. But your choice of starting point if you begin with your sense experience or a circumstance or um, a social situation, your starting point, uh, it depends on the kind of questions you have and the kinds of knowledge that you're after. So we could think about this like if we want to learn more about trees, right? If we want to understand why an oak tree is different from a pine tree, uh, we could approach that question from biology, right? Or uh, what I think is dendrology, right? That's, uh, you're looking at what some of these things you can measure, test, and compare. Or we could ask questions about trees when it comes to the best kind of wood for building a ship. Or we can uh, talk about the social experience of trees. Like oaks lose their leaves in the winter, pine trees uh, don't. What does that communicate? How does it reflect it in various culture, cultures, right? 
So when it comes to disability, and this is how Pope John Paul II has been particularly helpful for me and my thinking, is when we begin with the fundamental principles of Christian anthropology, it highlights for me that the common ways, the familiar ways of thinking about disability uh, uh, have a utility and a value, but sometimes they don't answer the entire question. So uh, uh, I'm sure most of the folks listening or a lot of the folks listening are familiar with the medical model of disability, right? So the medical model of disability is when our thinking begins with things we can measure, test, and compare. Right? How does the body work? It, is it functional? Um, and what are the implications of the body functioning, right? There's the rights model of disability. Our thinking begins with justice and injustice and the rights that are due and all the rules and protections that are fair about what is fair. Or we, or we have the, the social model of disability and our thinking begins with um, the experience of folks who are impaired or ill or injured uh, and their, uh, uh, their experience of inclusion and exclusion. And so each of those is fine and wonderful. Like genuine insights arise from them uh, and so that they shouldn't be dismissed. Um, but for John Paul II and what he reminds us uh, uh, when it comes to the starting point, this is the big value that I draw, is that he reminds us that we can't explore theological questions about disability if and we can't explore the theological insights into disability if our starting point doesn't include the basic things that Christian confessed to be revealed by God. He points me, he points us to the gospel, to the, to the good news, to Jesus. Um, uh, um, and among the most basic things that Christians confess is that we're creatures, that a loving and merciful creator, that we're formed in the image of God and we're vulnerable and we're called to friendship, love of God and love of neighbor. It doesn't mean we can't use the disability models. They can very, be very useful, but it does mean that the models, at least this is what I take from Pope John Paul II, the models can give us only an incomplete picture. But if we want the full picture as revealed in and through Jesus, uh, we attend to the principles and the foundation of the faith, the things we confess and hold to be true. Thank you, that was helpful. Um, you mentioned in your talk that there is a beauty that we must learn to see. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about how, how do we as human beings learn to see beauty? Right, uh, how do we learn to see beauty? Okay, so, uh, uh, I mean, to just set a framework, like, like so in the talk, um, uh, the beauty that we must learn to see is how the complex picture of how our various vulnerabilities and limitations, our strengths and abilities, weaknesses, gifts, graces, how, the, how these all fit together. That's, that's the beauty we need to learn to see. Uh, how all these differences complement one another and are completed in one another. Uh, so that's the, that's the beauty we must learn to see. So how do we learn to see this? Well, uh, according to the teachings of the church, each of us learned this in the ordinary way. Uh, Christians learn this in the ordinary way. It's by participating in the sacraments. It's by living in communion with one another. It's by ministering to others and being ministered to. Uh, it's to participate in this life, the life of the body of Christ. And it takes a lifetime to learn. This is a journey, it's the journey of our life in Christ. Uh, and it's one that has an arc. Um, uh, it begins with an, a personal encounter for Christians, a personal encounter with Jesus within the body, uh, within the body of Christ, as we administer the love of mercy, uh, 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 the love and mercy of God to one another as, as we receive it from one another. That's how we learn to see it. This is what I've learned from St. Pope John Paul II and Thomas Aquinas. And there are the ways folks can, uh, uh, there, there's a number of ways this has been answered within the Christian tradition, but it's, it's very basic. Um, um, but uh, even just that basic point, right? Uh, it was important, it has been important for me, and I try to communicate that in the talk, uh, when we think about impairment, illness, and injury, and all those things that are classified and categorized under the heading disability, we're not doing a special kind of theological inquiry. We're not exiting um, standard, traditional Christian theological discourse. This goes right to the heart uh, of what it means to be uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, to journey together towards, uh, 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 towards, our, uh, towards God and towards communion with God. 
That's a really interesting point um, that every single human being has limitations. I was wondering if you could kind of touch upon some limitations that we might not necessarily think of at first. Some limitations that we might not necessarily think about at first. Um, uh, uh, okay, so uh, uh, so we're, we're in this context, right? So we're talking uh, uh, when it comes to disability, it's uh, we're, we're, our, our mind, our attention is drawn to um, impairment, illness, and injury, right? But uh, we are also reminded uh, in the gospel, uh, um, uh, uh, the health of the body is not necessarily the health of the soul. Um, we are reminded in the gospel, we're reminded in the good news that uh, man does not live on bread alone. Um, uh, 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 the various kinds of limitations that uh, the good news draws our attention to are the kinds of uh, uh, limitations that are highlighted in the works of mercy. So, for example, you know, we have works of mercy pertaining to food and water and shelter and protection and being imprisoned and being sick. Uh, we have, but with the spiritual works of mercy, uh, there are ignorance is a lack that is met um, by the, the work of mercy of teaching. Uh, um, uh, uh, being practical confusion, not knowing how to go on, that's a, that's a work of mercy that's ministered uh, uh, by attending to those who are doubtful, who are confused. Um, uh, being a sinner is a particular kind of lack and I, I need the forgiveness of those whom I've harmed, both who I know I've harmed and those for whom I'm still learning about the ways that I've harmed them. Um, I need the work of mercy. Uh, uh, we all need the work of mercy of companionship and solidarity. Um, we all need the work of mercy of prayer. Uh, there are, uh, uh, this is what's beautiful about the tradition of the church along these lines is uh, you get a complex picture about the whole arc of life. It's not just me in this moment, you or you in, in, in your particular moment. It's, uh, it's, it's the full picture, uh, the strengths and the weaknesses and how we all fit together. I think, I think that's beautifully said. I think something that I always uh, talk about in, in, in clinic and in, in the work that I do is about the importance of solidarity and the importance of accompaniment, right? And journeying with each other. And, um, but I think one thing that is often a struggle with a lot of people is, you know, we're talking about right now an ecumenical movement, right? An inner Christian movement. But, um, when we're looking at it from an interreligious community, when we're looking at it reaching out to others outside of the Christian uh, community who don't have the Christian anthropology, who don't have the, the belief that Christ is the risen Lord and uh, the Savior and doesn't have that to move from, doesn't have that as a starting point, um, then there's a potential room for a disconnect. And so where can we as Christian believers and followers um, meet that person where they are at um, when uh, Christian anthropology is not an option as a starting point. Yeah, uh, so that was that thread of um, uh, uh, inter-ecclesial, inter-religious uh, 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 cooperation, collaboration towards particular ends, uh, um, that is a, a dominant thread of discourse that we have uh, in Catholic, that we have in Catholic social teaching from uh, running from uh, Populum Progressio, Solicitudo Re Socialis, Caritas and Veritate. Um, uh, what does it mean for Christians to, first of all, engage in these kinds of works? It's, it's the moral witness of the church in the world. Um, but then how do we collaborate? So that thread of, of collaboration, uh, the, among the elements that I've been most appreciative of, and this is, this is, a, this is a point where you, you hear the, the uh, the appreciation of Pope Benedict XVI for the theology of Father Gustavo Gutierrez and the liberation theology movement. Um, a, a, a lot of folks don't realize this, right? That, that uh, the liberation theology movement was complex um, and there were threads that, um, um, uh, that, that went some odder directions. Uh, but Pope Benedict XVI in particular, he found a deep appreciation for the, the thread of Father Gustavo Gutierrez and Father Gustavo Gutierrez we see his, uh, his way of thinking picked up by Pope Benedict XVI, uh, that no matter what, Christians remain rooted, uh, rooted and grounded in the, the why of what they're doing. That, that, that can't be confused for their personal involvement, but that doesn't exclude the, the possibility and the option for collaboration and the potential for collaboration. That's part of how we give moral witness to the good news. Um, 
we walk alongside and we walk together. Uh, um, the hope, this is how Pope Benedict XVI says, in Caritas and Veritate, is that this is, that they will, they will, uh, that we will inspire uh, and, uh, and prompt questions about why are you doing it? Um, well, I'm doing it because I love Jesus, because, uh, uh, because I once was lost, but now I'm found. Um, I was blind, but now I see. I am broken and weak and vulnerable, but I've been given grace and I've been called homeward. That's why I do this. That's why, um, that's why I march. That's why I protest. That's why I feed the hungry. Um, that's why I pray. That's why I teach. I do it um, for the love of God. Because I've been taught, I've been received, I've been welcomed, I've been forgiven. That's why I do it. Um, uh, I love that part of Catholic social teaching. And I think it is underappreciated. Um, uh, 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 I, I think we insert, in a, we, we can miss it and overlook it. Um, uh, that, uh, that collaboration is part of our call. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Are there any implications how we should understand the catechetical mission of the church based on your talk? Um, the catechetical mission, catechetical mission of the church. Well, uh, uh, thank you for that, Esther. Uh, so uh, at the most, uh, the work of catechesis, the ministry of catechesis is, is, is focused on teaching, on in instructing the ignorant. Um, uh, mercy seems to be mercy seems to be one of the themes today, and I'm I'm, I'm thrilled about that. I, I I teach at a mercy institution, Salve Regina University is a mercy institution. Like this is part of how we think, uh, and, and we 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 work hard to incorporate into our life as a as a as a educational institution. Um, but your question is about catechesis. Catechesis is a work of mercy pertaining to uh, a lack of knowledge, uh, ignorance, and not just lack of knowledge, but practical know-how. So uh, instructing the ignorance and giving guidance to those who are confused, these are works of mercy. That's the work of catechesis, it's, uh, uh, is to communicate uh, uh, the message, the good news, and also to give a practical example and, and, to, and to form uh, uh, young women and young men, uh, or old women and old men, uh, uh, into uh, the life of the church. Um, so the catechal mission catechetical mission of the church and ministry of the church uh, in this particular moment is one that is, uh, uh, or with, with respect to disability or impairment, illness, and injury, is, uh, is oftentimes thought of as like, okay, how can we teach and how can we give practical guidance to those who are, who are impaired, you know, to them? So we have a habit and a tendency of thinking that way, and that comes from our culture and complexities of, uh, you know, uh, complexities of history. Um, the bigger picture that Christians have by way of the good news, it shines a light on all the various uh, limitations and weaknesses that we have within the body. Um, uh, the things that I need to be taught, the knowledges I need to be taught, and, and the practices I need to be introduced to um, are ones that don't only pertain to uh, 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 the, the obvious uh, lacks of knowledge and the obvious uh, practical uh, uh, incompetencies, but also, uh, you know, uh, if I was a racist, you know, if I had a ra if, if I had racist views, part of catechesis would, would be to introduce me to the knowledge, but also to uh, to train me and help me and guide me in the practices to live in a way that doesn't live life according to that illusion, um, uh, to that just that sinful that, that that form of structural sin. Uh, uh, there's an opportunity here, I think, for catechists uh, to be inspired um, uh, by the heart of catechesis, uh, the heart, uh, uh, not only uh, for those who seem to be weak or ignorant in the moment, but also those who seem to be strong, because there are things that those who seem to be strong, who seem to be comfortable, and, and who seem to have their life together, they have needs too. Um, and uh, those needs are sometimes uh, uh, attached to their privilege. Um, attached to my privilege. Uh, and I need the grace and the gift of someone who will teach me uh, things that I didn't know about my participation and my part in structural sin and structural injustice. Um, 
this isn't uh, a stretch. This is this is Pope John Paul II as solicitudere socialis. This is this is old school, straight up Orthodox traditional uh, Catholic social teaching, uh, reconcil reconciliation and penitence, a document by Pope John Paul II in 1984, where we learn about social sin and structural sin. Um, uh, this goes straight to the heart of the gospel and the good news that uh, 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 these things, this is part of the work of catechesis. Thank you, Miguel. Sure, thank you for that question. As a catechist, you know, you always want to go to the, to the heart, and this, the heart is the mission of, of you know, Jesus and his model of catechesis. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I questions. have. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Father. Um, no, I just had more of a comment than a uh, uh, than a question. Uh, but um, you, uh, Miguel, you mentioned uh, uh, liberation theology, theology, and Gustavo Gutierrez, who um, has done some really wonderful work. And I think um, at the heart of evangelization, and I think at the heart of uh, catechesis, is the recognition, and this is what he says, of, is the recognition that. Um, we are all humans. Is it first recognizing that we are humans and uh, that we are uh, loved by God? And so I think one of the struggles that a lot of people face, especially those who are uh, experience disability, um, people don't see them as a whole person. Um, they see them as unable to fully function in the wholeness of life, um, and they don't see them as. Um, Fully, fully human and fully divine um, through the image of Christ. And so I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit or um, just how do we, how do we help to, uh, people to see that just because, just because I have a disability, just because I struggle with uh, language or uh, anxiety or hearing voices or ability to walk doesn't mean that I'm not as fully human as a person who is um, who has those abilities. Yeah. So, uh, I, I will be bold and I, and I'll, I'll take a moment to be bold in my convictions as a Christian. Um, uh, I think it's okay to just name a, a heresy, a heresy. Um, uh, there are, there are, uh, doctrinal heresies related to the Trinity. There are doctrinal heresies, uh, related to, uh, to uh, uh, the incarnation of God in Christ. Um, there are heresies uh, uh, related to how we understand the work of Christian theology, right? Or the, uh, but there are also heresies related uh, uh, to uh, concerning what it means to be a human being, to be a creature created in the image and likeness of God. Um, Now, when we think about heresy, like that, that's a that's a that's a big word to toss around, but uh, a heresy is usually contrasted with orthodoxy. And what makes a heresy a heresy isn't that it's opposite of the truth, that it's opposite of orthodoxy. What makes a heresy a heresy is that it's it's a perversion, it's a twisting, it's an incomplete truth. It doesn't reflect the fullness of the gospel. It doesn't re reflect the fullness of the good news. And I think I believe. Uh, uh, that as a Christ, that as Christians we uh, uh, let, let me take this back. Let me take one step back. Uh, uh, I think that it belongs to uh, uh, the, the magisterium and the teaching uh, 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 the magisterium to identify heresies of this sort. And we see this in Pope, uh, 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 Catholic social teaching is one of the places where we have an encyclical tradition. We have a teaching tradition within the church where heresy is called out when it comes to uh, these structural sins and social uh, social sins, and a lot of those pertain to a defective or incomplete or heretical theological anthropology. Uh, uh, we uh, this but this comes out in, in, in with respect to class. Like uh, um, uh, Rerum Novarum was was part of this. Uh, this comes out uh, with respect to uh, uh, to race. This comes out with respect to uh, impairment, illness, and injury. Um, there are things, uh, defective anthropologies, incomplete accounts of what it means to be a human being. Um, and I look to the church. I look to, uh, in particular, uh, Pope St. John Paul II and Joseph Ratzinger um, and Pope Francis, and mostly because these are the ones who, the, these have been the popes while I've been alive. 
And, and so their writings have been particularly important to me. But we can go back to Paul the Sixth. We can uh, go back uh, even further to the fathers of the church, Augustine, Aquinas, and we can get clues along these lines about what it means to be faithful, uh, uh, faithful in our convictions but, uh, and faithful in our practices with respect to that basic fundamental truth uh, 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 of the gospel. Did I answer your question, Father? No, you did, and I, I think you did it well because I think you, you reminded us and brought us back to the importance of Christian anthropology and the, specifically the importance of um, our, uh, our popes and our uh, early fathers um, and the work that they did to really get the ground running um, to allow Pope Francis, you know, uh, Benedict, and all of these encyclicals to be really rooted in Augustine and Aquinas and um, some of the earlier fathers. So thank you. We have another question from one of our participants. How do we move beyond a separate group that is disabled in ministry and in parishes in a way that is relevant and meaningful? Um, how do we move on? Uh, I do not have a theory. I do not have a, uh, a special key um, uh, or magical solution. Um, uh, the, the next step, how do we go on, uh, is one that belongs to the heart of a church. What is it, it, it's, it goes to the heart of Christian discipleship. What does it mean to follow Jesus, um, to be... Uh, uh, to take up our cross, um, whatever that looks like, um, and uh, to live in solidarity, but then also to bear faithful witness. How do we move on? We move on by, uh, uh, by growing in faith, hope, and love, um, uh, um, by growing in the virtues, by receiving the gifts of the Holy Spirit, by participating in the sacraments, in, in, uh, by participating in the life of the church, by, um, by learning and receiving and contemplating Christ crucified uh, uh, and Christ resurrected by participating and living the liturgy of the church, we move on by allowing ourselves to be changed and transformed by the good news. That's, um, uh, that's what I believe. Uh, and, and, and that's my best understanding of what the church teaches. And when it comes to these, like, the particular challenges, right, the particular challenges of the moment, uh, and in our in this circumstance for this webinar, right, in this conversation, is uh, you know different forms, different ways that um, the social sins and the structural sins of our society has infected and reflected itself on the life of the body of Christ. Um, uh, the the first response is faithfulness. Uh, uh, be faithful. Identify sin. Recognize. Uh, in humility, our fallenness, our brokenness, my fallenness, my brokenness, uh, all the various ways that we are unfaithful to the good news and we don't live it out in our lives, um, that's how we move on. And, and you know what that looks like practically in this case or that case, in that moment, uh, or this circumstance, uh, uh, I think the resources of the church uh, uh, point us towards, there's not one a uh, key one theory that's going to be a catch-all solution. Um, it's it's uh, the form of life, the patterns of life, and the rhythms of life that Christians call holiness. It marks and charts a way forward uh, that is alive, and you can't prescribe that. Um, but on the other hand, like I love theories, I love plans, I love concrete, um, uh, you know, ministry and missions, and it's like we know what we're doing. Uh, but if we think that's the answer, um, we make a mistake and we confuse a plan, um, uh, a plan for mission. We, conf we confuse um, uh, a competency with holiness. Uh, the challenge is to live into our discipleship to Christ. And um, that's the challenge and that's the call. I think that's how we go on. I can't improve upon that. Like that's, I can't improve upon the call to discipleship. Um, and I don't want to because I found life uh, following Jesus.
Thank you. We have time for probably one more question. Um, and this is a question we've gotten a couple times here. Um, and we touched about it a little bit in the beginning, but with everything going on in our country right now with respect to race, wondering if there's a way that you can connect the lesson of your talk to how the gospel responds to the sin of racism. Hmm. Um. The, um, where do I begin? Uh, all right. Okay. So, uh, in the world I grew up in, uh, the life and the rhythm of my family, uh, was shaped, uh, most deeply by at least two things, um, two complex gifts. Uh, there was the, the gift of my brother Vicente and all the ordinary things that go along with, uh, uh profound intellectual disability. Uh, uh, that was just integral to our family life. And another complex gift is what it means to be Chicano, Mexican-American, the Mexican-American cultural heritage of my family. Um, uh, and and, and add, you can add to that other economic challenges that I won't go into. You know, so, you know, growing up, I had, you know, there's this complex intersection of uh, disability, impairment, being a clumsy family together, being Chicano, Mexican-American, um, uh, uh, economic challenges. So to this day, I have not been able to fully disentangle all the various forms of, uh, of exclusion, times of alien felt like alienation, bigotry, disregard that I, uh, that we experience as a family. You know, I can ask like, did they treat us that way because of Vicente? Did they treat us that way because we're Hispanic? Uh, did they treat us that way because we're Catholic? Um, uh, did they treat us that way be, are they treating us that way because we're poor? Uh, or is there some other reason, right? Uh, uh, we can ask those kinds of questions, but in the ordinary life, in a person's life, these things, they live together, it's organic. Um, in this moment, uh, you know, with uh, um, uh, the, the structural sin, the social sin that's being brought to light, um, uh, uh, we have an opportunity as Christians um, to uh, go back to the heart of the matter. Um, uh, uh, what does it mean to be a creature uh, and to have a loving creator be formed in the image and likeness of God, to be called to love and intimacy with God and with each other? What does that mean and what does that look like? And, uh, you know, there, there's love of God and that's fundamental. This is, uh, this is what we are called to. And we love God through a love of our neighbors. These things go together. Um, uh, and the greatest of all the virtues, according to St. Thomas, pertaining to love of neighbor is the works of mercy. Uh, and that's complex. It's messy, but we are complex and we are messy. Uh, uh, this, is the, this is the social teaching of the church on these sorts of matters. It's, it's, a, it's a seamless cloth. These things hang together, and they hang together not because of some uh, magical nuance of theory and theology and, and philosophical arguments. They hang together because it is true. Uh, it, they hang together because we have one God, one creator, uh, uh, who sustains us and maintains us and holds us in being, who loves us and who's calling us in love uh, to be reconciled and who's calling us to be reconciled with each other. Um, uh, we don't have to compartmentalize disability, uh, race, um, uh, structural economic inequality. Uh, uh, we don't have to compartmentalize those things. We can think these things together. Now, it would be a mistake if I did not mention uh, the USCCB statement, Open Wide Our Hearts, uh, uh, the Enduring Call of Love, a pastoral letter against racism. This is 2018. You got to read it. That's your, if, oh, if you have homework, that should be one bit of your homework. Read the pastoral letter from the USCCB uh, on disability and, and read the USCC, USCCB statement, uh, Open Wide Our Hearts. It goes together. Um, uh, and it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of our life in Christ, res responsive to challenges of the moment and pains of the moment and the various ways that structural sin and social sin inflects itself in the life of the church. We have an opportunity to bear faithful witness. And what a joy, right? This is, this is what St. Paul talks about, uh, you know, the joy of bearing faithful witness to the good news. Um, uh, 
then sometimes that faithful witness, bearing faithful witness is hard. Um, it takes courage, um, but that's discipleship. Thank you very much. Um, we are gonna wrap up in one moment, but I was just wondering if you could say real quickly what the name of your new book will be. Someone has, was wondering and when they could have, when it would be available for purchase. Okay, so uh, it's a, a Destiny of the Wounded Creature, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas on Disability. It's a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm revising chapters right now. Um, uh, and uh, I'm hoping that, uh, assuming everything will go, go according to plan, that uh, uh, the, the publisher will have it out sometimes towards the end of the year, but uh, these things are beyond me, those, those, uh, those unfoldings. Uh, if someone did want to read the, uh, what I've written about these sorts of matters, I, I have a, a quite a number of articles uh, um, on these sorts of themes, uh, um, uh, the goodness and beauty of our fragile flesh. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's an article I wrote uh, on these themes. I have also written an article about St. Thomas Aquinas on profound intellectual disability. Um, uh, I have some other works on catechesis and, and virtue. I have some other stuff where I talk about these things in, uh, 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 in the 16th century. In fact, how, um, I have a, a book chapter I just finished uh, a few months ago uh, that highlights this relationship between uh, the racialization of the human body and the way we think theologically about disability, how this all unfolded in the 16th century. Uh, 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 ar uh, the arguments and claims pertaining to the, uh, the status of the American Indian peoples and how disability was part of that argument and part of that conversation. In any case, uh, if folks are interested, those things are available. Great, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Romero, for being with us here today. And thank you, Father Fred and Esther, for being here as well. And thank you to all the attendees as well. Um, if you liked this resource and you are able to support NCPD and more resources like this, please consider donating on our website. Um, have a wonderful day and God bless. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, Esther. Thank you, Julia. Thank you.